Hi, it's Miss Reese. I am on page 13. We're in your unit five packet and we're on page 13. I'm going to be going over the proofs on page 13 and on page 14. Um, so first we just want to kind of look at the format of what a proof looks like. It will be helpful as you're working through this problem, these problems to have your toolkit out as well. And the, t the pages that I might go back and reference on your toolkit are going to be pages um, 31. So right here, reason sides are congruent and up through page 32, the reasons why angles are congruent. Okay. Um, so first thing is knowing kind of, oh, and also we'll start here actually, we'll reference um, the format of a proof. So remember there's three parts here. The first part I like to always um, say like, this is the main part of the proof where you have three statements leading to the triangles being congruent to each other. So statement here, statement here, statement with a reason below each of them leading to our congruent triangles. Now, of course, we can have bubbles that come above the proof, you know, parts of that being congruent. And then if we're not trying to prove the triangles are congruent, if we're trying to prove parts of the triangles are congruent, that would be after the proof. So we'll talk about that format as well. So we'll be looking, I guess, at page 30, 31, and 32 of your toolkit. Um, so back to page 13, um, you are going to have a same or similar format for each of these problems here meaning each of these problems should have three parts leading to congruent triangles. And then you'll notice here what we're actually trying to prove is that their parts are equal. This is remember the CPCTC. So this basic format will work for each of these problems. The only difference is that we might add some things above in the boxes. If you would prefer, um, this would be my preference if I was doing, as I am going to do this, I'm going to do this on a one piece of paper for each proof, or I would just maybe use more space if you feel like you write a little bit larger. Uh, maybe you want to put two proofs on this page and then you need an extra sheet for the rest of your work. So depending on how large you write, you might want another sheet of paper. So that's why I have it over here. So I've got my one proof. We've got our given information um, and what we're trying to prove at the very end. So we'll kind of go through my strategy of how I look through at these problems. So the first thing I would identify is my given statements. So my first given statement is that we have parallel lines, A, B, and E, D. They are parallel to each other. So what we could do is we could trace A, B, and we could also trace E, D. When we trace them, if you want to connect them, remember we are creating a Z shape or an F shape. So anytime you have parallel lines, and we'll look back at our reasons, angles. Okay, we've got parallel lines. Oh, okay, so I know I'm either creating an F shape, which is corresponding angles, or a Z shape, alternate interior. So looking back on my picture here, based on those lines that I've highlighted, I should be able to create a Z shape. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight them. Oops. We've got these two sides. I'm going to connect them. I'm going to make a Z out of them. And it would really be the angles that are in between those Z's that would be equal to each other. So I would put a congruent angle mark here and a congruent angle mark here. I'm going to erase my highlighted lines. Um, I like to mark up my whole diagram first. My other given information is that BD bisects AE. Remember the word after bisect is what's being cut in half. So if I look at AE, well, here's AE, this whole segment here. If that segment's being cut in half, well, then both parts of that segment would be equal. I'm going to put a mark here and here. So now I've used both parts of my given information. Um, I can either do vertical angles here at the center, or if I also looked at my lines that were parallel, these two lines here, instead of creating a Z from B to D, I could have created a Z from A to E. So you can technically use um, vertical angles or the other set of alternate interior angles. I'm going to do vertical angles for the problem here. Because anytime I see these bow tie questions, I always remember vertical angles. Okay. 
So now I know the triangles are congruent because we've got here, that's an angle mark. Here's another angle mark. And here's a side that's marked. So I know out of the five reasons, it's angle, angle, side, or it's angle, side, angle. And the way I can tell the difference is if I trace the side that has a marking on it, which is this side here, um, in order for it to be angle, side, angle, it needs to go in the middle of those two. So I know it is not in the middle of those two angles. It doesn't connect to both of them. So it's got to be angle, angle, side. So then I can almost start working backwards on my proof. Okay, so I know it's angle, angle, side. I know there needs to be three congruent statements here leading to the triangles being congruent. So my triangle, we could say um, ACB is congruent to triangle ACB would be ECD. And we knew they're congruent because the marks we put on there is angle, angle, side. Okay, once we proved those parts or those triangles are congruent, well, the part that we're trying to prove, that last piece here, we can say is also true. If the triangles are congruent, the rest of their parts are going to be congruent as well. I never add the marks of what I'm trying to prove to the diagram because if I added these marks here, I would just get confused and I would maybe give a different triangle congruency reason for that. So never put that on the bottom. But I can put it here. I know these parts are going to be equal because I just proved the triangles are congruent. And then I kind of work backwards on my proof. Remember, this is always CPCTC. That stands for corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Now I can kind of work backwards and say, okay, well, what did I mark on my diagram that I said, okay, I had three, two congruent angles and a congruent side. Okay, well, let's look first. We said angle B and D were congruent. And remember, we created that Z shape, angle B and D. So the Z shape, oh yeah, that's alternate interior angles. And you can almost see like how the format of the proof is. So we've got the parallel lines leading to the alternate interior angles. So we're gonna do that here as well. So I've got parallel line statement. When I have parallel lines, A, B, parallel to E, D, which was given, that tells me that I have congruent angles, which are, we can say, the alternate interior angles, the Z angles. And we know alternate interior angles are congruent. We have parallel lines. Um, the next thing that we looked at was the other given statement here that we bi are bisecting something. So that's why we were able to put marks here and here onto the sides. We knew that AC was congruent to EC. And the reason we said there was congruent was because of this other given information that we had a bisector. So I can say BD bisects AE. That was our given information. And it told us that these parts here would be equal. That's the definition of bisector. And then we also put a mark at the vertical angles, but technically, remember I said you if, could have done the other alternate interior angles, but our vertical angles don't need anything to prove that they're equal. So we could just say angle, you can't call those angles C because there's technically three things located, but we can call it A, C, B which would be congruent to angle E, C, D. Those are vertical angles. And also the order in which you're placing each of these three boxes doesn't necessarily need to have, you know, doesn't need to be in the angle statement here, the side statement here, and the angle statement here. So really the order that these go in doesn't technically matter. As long as your parallel line is leading to or has an arrow to alternate interior angles and your bisector statement leads to the bisector um, statement here as well. All right, let's try our second proof. Um, so we've got another set of parallel lines again. So we're going to be creating some Z shapes. Um, we've got a given statement here. So again, I like to mark up my diagram first. That's my preference. 
So I've got AB is parallel to CD. So here's AB. And it is parallel to CD. Here's CD. And I'm going to highlight them to connect. Oh, I've got a Z shape. So my angles inside the Z are going to be congruent to each other because they're alternate interior. So that's going to be these angles here, alternate interior. And then we've got angle B and D. That's just given. It's in my, I'm going to put two marks on B and two marks on D. And then I've used up all my given information. So then I say, well, what else can I prove is equal? And without any givens, the only other things you can add are reflexive or vertical angles. And so this one has a reflexive shared common side. So then we've got, okay, is it angle, angle, side? Or is it angle, side, angle? And while we say, okay, this angle D here doesn't connect to the side, so it has to be angle, angle, side. So this one I'll do in kind of the starting out point, and we'll go into the proof that in the normal way. I usually sometimes do it backwards. Um, so then let's see, we've got A, B is parallel to C, D. So remember, because it's parallel, we were able to add these marks here. So that needs to have a box here. I'm going to say A, B is parallel to C, D. That's going to lead me to a piece, given piece of information. So I'm going to say, or that was given rather, and that's going to lead me to know those two angles were equal. So we've got angle, we can't call that angle A because there's a couple angles that look like angle A. So I'll call it C, A, B is congruent to um, if I did C, A, B, I'd want to do A, C, D. Remember, those are the same types of angles. Those are the angles, the alternate interior. Angles. Um, now, my other part of the given, B, D is congruent, or angle B is congruent to angle D. If I put that here, well, that just can go directly into one of these other boxes here. That's our given information. We didn't have to do anything to figure that out. I'm just going to write given there. And then the other side was just the shared common side. We can say AC is congruent to AC. That's the reflexive property. We don't need any information to figure that out that comes prior. And then... Um, Look here, this is the last piece, what we're trying to prove. So we know that it goes to the bottom. I didn't need this extra box for anything, so I can delete that. And then I just need to now put in my triangle congruent reason here. So we've got triangle. Remember those three things lead to the triangles being equal and we said angle, angle, side. So we can say triangle CAB is congruent to triangle a, C, D. And that's because of angle, angle, side. And then if those triangles are congruent, the rest of the parts or the sides would be congruent as well. So we call that C, P, C, T, C. Okay, proof number three. So for this one here, we have a perpendicular. So I'm going to look back and remind myself, anytime I'm using perpendicular, it really has an extra box that leads to a congruent statement or an extra box that leads to um, a right angle, a right triangle statement. So let's first decide, OK, am I going to make use a side angle side proof or is this an HL proof? So for these, I like to I do like to work backwards. So I'm going to put my right angle symbol here perpendicular, so I've got a right angle. I also know H is the midpoint of E, F, so I'm going to put congruent marks here and here. If it's the middle of the line, it's made those two parts equal. And then we've also got this reflexive side. So then I'm going to say to myself, okay, well, I've got a right triangle, but the hypotenuses are not marked. And technically, this is a side, this is an angle, and this is a side. And that angle is in the middle, it is in between. So this is a side angle side congruency. So that tells me I need three congruent statements here. So I'm going to kind of follow the format of perpendicular, perpendicular, 
leading to having right angles, which are therefore congruent. So we've got to have three boxes here. So I'm going to put that off to the side. Um, so let me actually, I've got my boxes. I've got one box here. That's going to be my perpendicular. That's going to lead to another piece of information. I'm going to do an arrow. So I don't have as much space to stack them on each other. So I'm just going to do an arrow here and then an arrow here. Or actually, I, I might stack them on top of each other. Let me we'll do that there. If you want to do them for, you know, saving space, if you want, I'm just going to stack these on top of each other, just like they are in the toolkit. Okay. So remember, we've got our given information, perpendicular. What it, this upside down T, that means perpendicular. That means those angles are right angles. That's the definition of perpendiculars that we're making right angles. So I should be able to say angle EHG and angle FHG are right angles. And because they're both right angles, that means they need to be equal. So that's going to lead here. So I can now say they're congruent. So EHG is congruent to FHG. And that is because right angles are congruent. Right angles are congruent. There we go. So I've used my first piece of given information. Great, the perpendicular. Um, now, something else in the given information is that we have a midpoint. So I'm going to put that here. I'm going to put that in the box. That's our given. And that led me to know that well, I said H is the midpoint of EF. So that means EH is congruent to FH. And that's because it's a midpoint. You could say def of midpoint. And then the other side that was equal was that shared common side, this GH side. Because that's the same exact side in both of these triangles, we would call that the reflexive property. And what those three pieces of information came together to tell me is that our triangles were congruent, remember, because of side angle side. So we can say triangle EHG is congruent to triangle FHG. And if those triangles are congruent, not only are these three parts equal, the rest of the parts are equal. So that means angle E and F have to be equal to each other or congruent. And that's CPCTC. Okay. On to, I believe, proof number four. Um, so we've got our bisector here, and we are bisecting, it looks like, uh, two different angles. So we can add our marks on the diagram for that. So we're bisecting x, w, y. x, w, y. Okay, so that means my angles here on the right side are going to be cut in half and now equal. We're also bisecting the other angle, x, z, y. I'm going to put two marks there. No other given information, so I have to use this side here that they both have in common. We call that the reflexive side. All right, so we're going to need three congruent pieces of information here to prove the triangles are congruent. All right, so we've got some congruent angles, and we know those angles are congruent because of a bisector. So I'm just going to copy that here. And I'm just going to put a box around it. I don't have my box here ready. So I'm just going to create my own and write given underneath it. Now, this one statement, I don't have to write it twice. It actually told me that two parts were equal. Remember, the, the right side, x, w, y. So these angles here, put this in pink. So that means X, W, Z, this top part of the angle. 
is congruent to YWZ. And that's the definition of bisector. The other angle is also going to be congruent. That's over here on the left side. So we can say angle x, z, w would be congruent to angle y, z, w. And that's also definition of bisector. And then the other side was just congruent because it's a um, shared common side. We call that reflexive. So z, w is congruent to z, w. Reflexive. So we've got three pieces of congruent um, parts. We know the triangles are congruent. So we'll say triangle. Uh, we'll do x, w, z. And we'll say that's congruent to triangle y, w, z. Sometimes I just take one of the angle statements from above and turn it into a triangle statement. And then I know they're congruent because here we've got an angle, we've got a side, and we've got an angle. And that side, if I were to trace this side, it is in between both of those angles. So that's angle, side, angle, congruency. Now, therefore, if these two triangles are congruent, not only will these parts that I've listed in this proof be equal, the rest of the parts will also be equal. So we should be able to say that ZX is congruent to ZY. That's what we were trying to prove up here. And that's, remember, CPCTC. Okay, on to proof number five. All right, we've got some given congruent parts here, and it's already marked on the diagram for us. That's nice. A and C are congruent. And then we've got some parallel sides. The parallel marks are already on our diagram as well. So it might be nice to just highlight those. These two sides are parallel. Remember, we create a Z or an F, so we're going to create a Z out of these two. We have to add the marks of congruency for that. I'm going to put two marks just to differentiate it from the previous ones. And then we've got that shared common side that we call that the reflexive side. So we're going to need, again, three pieces of congruent information here. OK, um, so easiest to maybe start with is the given information. Let's see. So we've got angle A is congruent to angle C. I'm just going to put that in the middle. That's given. Okay, so we've already used this first part. The other part is the parallel. Now, the parallel lines lead to parts being congruent to each other. So I'm just going to put this in a box right above. No, oh, no. Not working for that one. So I'm going to move this one over. There we go. Okay, now that is going to lead to parts being equal. That's why we added the marks here. So we've got a mark on A, B, D. And that would be congruent to C, D, B. So this was given the parallel lines. We created the Z's to find the alternate interior angles. So alternate interior. And then my last statement was the side that they both have in common. That's DB congruent to DB. That is reflexive. All right, so now we can say the triangles are congruent. So triangle, I'm just going to take this angle statement and turn it into a triangle. So ABD is congruent to triangle CDB. And that's because we have two angles and a side that is not in between them. So that would have to be angle, angle, side, congruency. And if those triangles are congruent, not only are these three parts equal, but the rest of the parts are equal as well. So AB would therefore be congruent to CD because corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Okay, and on to our last proof. 
Um, so we've got some given information on the diagram. So that's nice. We've got angle N congruent to angle L. And I can use one letter for those because there's really only one angle located at both of those letters, both of those points. That's given. Uh, we've also got JK and MK congruent. That's also given. And then the last angle is this angle here at the middle. We call those the bow tie angles. Those are congruent to each other without other given information needing to be told to us. Remember, we call those special bow tie angles vertical angles. And we cannot um, call them angle K. We do need to use three letters to name them because there's multiple things located at K. So we'll call it NKJ. And we could say that's congruent to angle, if we started with N, I'd maybe start with L, L, K, N. We've got three pieces. We've got another angle. We've got an angle and a side statement. We've got a lot of angle, angle, side in, this, in this, these problems. So we've got angle, angle, side congruency. And so our triangles will be congruent. We've got triangle N, K, J congruent to triangle L, K, M. And if the triangles are congruent, these other parts to the angles will also be congruent. So angle J would be congruent to angle M. Remember, we don't want to add that to our diagram because that might confuse us for figuring out why the triangles are congruent to begin with. Remember, that's going to be C, P, C, T, C.